welcome you to the Global Mental Health Action Network's webinar, Creating Hope Through Action on Suicide. Uh, my name is Tahas Fabri. I'm a doctor working in uh, public mental health in Pakistan. Um, I am the founder of the Skin Health Initiative, which is a non-profit, uh, focuses on, uh, on the prom promotion of mental health and prevention of mental illness in Pakistan. And I currently serve as, as Chief Operating Officer. Uh, suicide, decriminalization and prevention is a matter which is very close to my heart. Um, in Pakistan as well, we have a law uh, which criminalizes attempted suicide. So we've been trying to work on it to sort of uh, 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 have it uh, repealed. And I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to be with wonderful guests who I'll be uh, introducing, uh, who are working on different aspects of suicide in their own countries um, and, uh, 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 and, and doing a spectacular job. And I hope that all of you will also have uh, questions for our guests. And um, uh, if you have any questions, then please feel free to share in the chat and we'll come to those towards the end of the, web uh, 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 to, of the webinar. Um, uh, so this webinar is hosted by the Global Mental Health Action Network's Suicide Decriminalization Working Group uh, run by Mohammed Ali uh, Hassan, uh, who's a member of the United for Global Mental Health. And this group really focuses on uh, sort of producing evidence and, and creating a sort of uh, global traction for the decriminalization of suicide globally and uh, and has achieved a lot of successes, especially to, like the launch of the first uh, global report on the criminalization of suicide in which several of these uh, of our panelists were also party to. Uh, I'll now move on to the introduction of our honorable speakers. Um, so we have Mr. Emmanuel Niboy Guarshi. So Ni is a senior lecturer in the Department of Psychology, University of Ghana in West Africa. His research focuses on adolescent self-harm, suicide, and sexual violence prevention. His academic interests span community and applied health psychology, particularly adolescent mental health, community-based, and in-school interventions. Ni is passionate about promoting adolescent mental health in low- and middle-income countries, particularly those within Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Ni was awarded the prestigious 2021 D. Leo Fund Award by the International Association of Suicide Prevention for outstanding research on suicidal behaviors carried out in developing countries. So thank you, Ni, for joining us. Uh, we also have Mr. Duncan Nakoma. Uh, Duncan is a 26-year-old Zambian <laughs> mental health activist, the Global health, Mental Health Peer Network Executive Committee member, and an author of the book, Suicide is Not a Solution. He is also a survivor of three suicide attempts, and we are very grateful to have him here to share his life experience. Having struggled with depression and anxiety over 12 years, Duncan one day saw that the light of mental health and decided to go out there and be the light. The Global health, Mental Health Peer Network has given Duncan an opportunity to talk about his lived experience freely without discrimination. So thank you so much for joining us, Duncan, and being willing to share your uh, valuable experience. <laughs> Next up, we have Ms. Na uh, Naomi and Yango. Uh, Na uh, Naomi is a clinical psychologist based in Nairobi, uh, Ministry of Health, Department of Mental Health. She has conducted numerous uh, mental health and psychosocial support trainings targeting healthcare workers, humanitarian workers, among others. She's also been a researcher in the UNICEF M MAP study, which measures the mental health of adolescents at the population level, uh, the WHO quality rights assessor, and a board member of Basic Needs, Basic Rights Kenya. Thank you, Naomi, for joining us. Uh, we have Mr. John Brogdon. John is the president of Lifeline International and patron of Lifeline Australia, having served as its chairman from 2012 to 2021. He is a leading international advocate for suicide prevention. John lives with depression and suicidal ideation. So thank you so much, John, for joining us and sharing your experience. From 96 to 2005, John was the member for Pittwater in the NSW parliament. In 2002, he was elected leader of the opposition, the youngest person ever to lead a major political party in Australia. John's career in politics ended with a suicide attempt. 
he openly shares his story of success, failure, and redemption. In his business career, John is the chair of the Australian Payment Network uh, 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 and uh, is a trustee director of Avantios Investments Limited, an Australian $112 billion superannuation and pension fund. So thank you, John, uh, for coming and being willing to share your immense wisdom with our audience. And um, last but not the least, we have uh, Ms. Priti um, uh, Sridhar. Uh, Priti is, a CEO, is the CEO of the Marevala Health Initiative, a fantastic grant making and capacity building and advocacy organization working on mental health in India. She has 25 years of work experience in both for-profit and non-for-profit organizations at MHI. She manages the grantee portfolio and undertakes advocacy with multiple stakeholders, such as policymakers, national and international funders, caregivers, and other psychosocial support forums. She sits on the advisory board of the Global Mental Health Action Network and has been an active member of the Global Mental Health Action Network Finance Group, contributing to the policy brief for greater investment in mental health with finance ministers. Preeti also interacts with the World Health Organization and provides perspectives as a funding organization in a low to middle income country. So Preeti, as always, it's a pleasure to have you and the opportunity to learn from you is always a, a great experience. So thank you to all of our honorable speakers for joining us. And we moving uh, move on to our uh, first question. So the first question, which will be from John. So John, um, what was your motivation behind joining Lifeline? In your experience, is it more difficult to operate helplines in countries where suicide is illegal? And what are the, some of the main challenges that you have seen in your journey? John, I think you're on mute. Yes, Th thank you very much and hello everybody. Hello from Sydney, Australia. Um, and uh, I'd like to particularly start by acknowledging those of us um, who have lived or living experience of mental health and suicide. I'm on a bit of a global campaign uh, to change it from lived experience to living experience for people like me with depression and, and suicidal ideation. It's not in the past, it's in the present and it will be in the future as well. So um, anyway, there's my, there's my campaign for the, <laughs> for the, uh, for the event. Um, look, it is slightly different to be running a suicide prevention service in a country where suicide is a crime. Ultimately, ultimately uh, the authorities, just as they can, um, criminalised suicide could seek to criminalise people who are seen to be, if you like, assisting the act of suicide. So it does have that difficulty, although, although um, the centres who are members of Lifeline International who do operate in countries where suicide remains a crime um, do great work and uh, they have some limitations on what they can do that they wouldn't have in countries where suicide is not a crime. So for instance, in a country like Australia, where if somebody rings a lifeline Australia, um, we would, without, without thinking, without blinking, we would, if we made the assessment, um, send the authorities, send uh, the police and ambulance to where that person is to intervene and save their life. Um, that's harder to do in a country where suicide's a crime in case of the risk of uh, criminalisation. So it's harder, but I think we'd all agree um, there are stages of decriminalisation. So in, in countries like Australia, in most of our jurisdictions, most of our states, our territories, our provinces, um, 60, 70 years ago, suicide was a crime. Um, and in many cases, it was, well, when I say ignored, um, people, you know, doctors and good doctors and good police officers and good ambulance officers would um, turn a blind eye, if I can use that phrase, to the fact that it was a suicide to minimise the shame on the family and any risk of, any risk of criminal um, uh, enforcement. So we, we do see that happen in some countries. Uh, that, that's not um, in any way suggesting we, we all aren't going to stop campaigning to decriminalise suicide around the world. But there are some good people who turn a blind eye and um, help families get through a very difficult time. But uh, yes, I don't know, I'd say it's harder uh, 
chair. What I would say is it's different. Thank you, John. I think it's um, very well said. It's harder, and uh, um, and 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 I think the, moving on from that and going to a sort of Priti. So Priti, um, when it so, so so talking about decriminalization, right? So in India, how has suicide been decriminalized despite uh, the existence of the penal provision, and has the de facto decriminalization of suicide in India? positively impacted suicide prevention efforts. So we would love to know about that. Yeah. Thanks, Taha. Uh, so just so that everybody knows, in India, uh, the penal code still criminalizes suicide. And this is a colonial legacy from British, which many of the other Southeast Asian countries have. Uh, however, the Mental Health Care Act of 2017 in India uh, de facto decriminalized suicide by saying that any attempt of suicide would be assumed to be due to mental health issues and that the state has to prove otherwise. Now, what it does uh, enable is that uh, individuals who attempt suicide should not be subjected to criminal prosecution and should be given care and support. However, despite the law, the awareness of the change in law is low and suicide still gets counted as part of crime data. In fact, we just yesterday had the release of the 2021 uh, data through the national crime reports. Um, and every therefore suicide attempt becomes a medical legal issue. Uh, the police, the health practitioners are not aware about the change in uh, the law and uh, therefore have not been sensitized on how to work on this issue and how to provide support to the survivor or a bereaved family. Um, however, what the decriminalization of suicide in law does is that it gives an opportunity to the government to design and introduce a national suicide prevention policy. It allows that this indicator of the, uh, the suicide numbers are used as health indicators and it will also enable us to collect data on suicides as well as attempted suicides. Now, all of us know that data is important for us to understand and identify and define the problem of suicide to understand in greater detail what causes the acts of self-harm or suicide. It enables us to develop and implement interventions and of course scale uh, effective programs. I think the major benefit of decriminalization of suicide, at least in legal perspective, is it allows us to start talking about suicide as a health issue, as a public health issue. Um, and like any other public health issue, it then aims to identify, to reduce the illness, to identify risk factors and to have targeted policies and interventions. It then allows us to start talking about suicide prevention from not just a universal intervention perspective, but also a selective and indicative intervention perspective. Uh, Having it as a public health issue enables us to look at accessibility of services and look at equity in service delivery. It will allow us to start talking about which are the marginalized groups where death by suicides are higher and what kind of interventions will work in these groups. So for example, in India, death by suicide is highest in the 18 to 29 years group. But within that also, if we look further, then we realize that students from Dalit, Adivasi and Bahujan backgrounds, that is um, Adivasi is the indigenous people background, face, de uh, face caste-based de uh, caste based discrimination in premier educational institutes. Media reports say that there is high death by suicide among these in educational spaces and the backgrounds that these students come from are from marginalized backgrounds. So what decriminalization of suicide 
has done in India is that conversations on suicide have increased. They are still not at a level where I would say there are enough conversations, but at least you can talk about it because it's no longer a crime to attempt suicide. Um, what it does for us is to talk about stigma around suicide. It allows us to start talking that suicide is a complex issue and any preventive uh, measure or intervention measure needs to have a psychosocial approach, needs to have an intersectoral approach. It also allows people with lived experience, or as John was saying, people with living experiences can become part of advocacy campaigns. Um, it will also enable us to demand healthcare services for survivors of suicide or, um, or even people who have suicidal ideation. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, despite four years of implementation or actually supposedly implementation, uh, the awareness of the change in law is limited. Uh, there are still cases being filed against survivors of suicide. There is no national suicide prevention policy and therefore the government is yet to begin the work. Um, However, I think while the progress is slow, there is still hope because decriminalization of suicide has enabled us to move the conversation from an individual issue to a social issue. It allows us to have these conversations with participation of people with lived or living experiences. And more importantly, it allows us to do collaborative advocacy through alliances, and networks. So I still have hope uh, and expect things to improve in the coming future. Thank you so much, Thanks. Preeti. That was uh, a very informative. Um, uh, the picture in India is, of course, an inspiration uh, for a lot of countries where it's still an issue, so suicide criminalization. But of course, the challenges that you face can be a great learning experience uh, for us as well. So thank you for sharing that. So. Um, I would uh, uh, go next to uh, Ni. Um, so Ni, if you can you tell us a bit about uh, your journey in getting uh, Ghana's uh, policymakers to consider decriminalizing suicide? Uh, so yeah. Right. Thank you very much, Taha. Uh, it's a great opportunity to be here, and I'd like to say hello to everyone who is in attendance. Um, so yes, uh, Ghana's um, anti-suicide law was just like India, <laughs> bequeathed to us through uh, British colonial rule. Uh, we adopted this law somewhere in 1960, but the paradox is that by 1961, the British from whom we got it had decriminalized attempted suicide. But we have kept that law to date, and it's quite unfortunate. So um, some years forward, we started uh, our journey uh, towards decriminalization uh, in 2008, when we had done just a few studies about suicide in the country. And we, based on what we had read from other high income contexts, that really there's this new wave coming around that look, we don't need to have anti suicide laws because there are so many problems with that. And so we also thought, well, then let's put together a petition, present to our parliament. Um, to push for uh, decriminalization. We did that. And I remember in 2012, on the 10th of September, it was a Monday. It was uh, it's a significant day because, you know, uh, it's a World Suicide Prevention Day. So we took this petition to the Parliament of Ghana. Um, it was received, but we got no official feedback. The indirect and, um, um, and some non-official feedback we received were that, look, you guys had no sufficient basis to push for this grand agenda. So that first effort taught us some great lessons. And in fact, I can summarize those lessons in just two, um, um, in two ways. One is that now, seeking to understand the legal position of a country in relation to suicide, particularly decriminalization of attempted suicide, requires 
contextually relevant and culturally sensitive research. This was the first hard lesson we learned from the first petition we presented. The second lesson was that the views and voices of key political and legal actors must be considered in the advocacy and generation of political priority for mental health policies and legislation. And we thought that these two lessons were very important for our next move. So we had to regroup. It's actually a small group of researchers in the country at the moment. Thankfully, over the years, we've been able to raise other people through PhD and other um, stakeholder groups by way of NGOs and third sector um, professionals who have all come on board. Then we started strong research drive. We started targeting key stakeholders to get their attitudes towards suicide and particularly their views on the law, the anti-suicide law of Ghana. So we involved students, I, I can put them all in about 10 or so clusters. So students and young people um, across various levels of education from basic through university, the teachers and school staff, um, social workers. The third group will be the police. Uh, next will be judges, magistrates and lawyers. Then of course, media personnel. We also engage community and traditional leaders medical and mental health professionals, religious leaders. The ninth group were um, community leaders and lay persons. And then the final group, members of parliament. So as we were progressing, we were conducting studies on their attitudes and as and when we got any findings from any of the studies from each of these groups, we engaged them you know, try to organize trainings and sensitize them about um, the effects of the law and then, you know, their own attitudes towards suicide and suicidal persons and so on. So it was like a double pronged approach. We conducted research, we quickly engaged with the relevant stakeholders with the evidence from the research. And as we were going, we were lobbying and building some momentum. Then eventually we decided to put in a second petition. This time, quite solid, um, we, we had managed to engage various strong voices and key stakeholders um, as part of our evidence base. So we got that presented. Um, it took a while, but thankfully there were others who were doing some, you know, other um, backdoor connections and, and trying to lobby for, you know, further effects uh, or add weight to the petition. Uh, we had a call one day uh, that we uh, would be, um, uh, we needed to engage with um, a committee uh, put, uh, put together by parliament to really um, uh, share what exactly we want to be done. Uh, thankfully, um, I'm happy to mention people like Professor Joseph Osafo, um, Professor Charity Akotia, and a host of others um, who were part of this meeting. Now, they engaged with a parliamentary select committee and it was a fruitful meeting. The conclusion of that meeting was that, yes, this has come to uh, us at the right time. Uh, many of us are also considering this, um, i.e. decriminalizing attempted suicide. So long and short of it all is that, as I speak to you, um, a private member's bill uh, is um, underway, being drafted. And once that is through, the next steps will be the main legal processes. So in Ghana, the legal system is such that whether you are promulgating a new law or you are seeking to repeal, the processes can be quite similar. So basically there can be about three readings um, before the floor of parliament. And so what we are waiting for now is for the um, private members be able to be um, reviewed and everything, then it will be tabled um, for the first reading. Uh, on the floor of parliaments. And once that goes through, it means that we, we will wait and you know, see what happens to the second and then subsequently the third reading. And then hopefully if all three readings are successful and all reviews have been approved, it will go through um, for presidential accent. And at that stage, we're looking forward to celebrating with the rest of you and the rest of the world for that huge success because it has taken also sharing ideas and data from yeah. um, the rest of you who have been through this already. Mm -hmm. So in brief, this is our story.
in Ghana. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you so much. And it's, uh, it's great to hear about the different tools that you use, which enable you to achieve success. And I'm sure uh, these can be applied to other uh, uh, settings as well. So thank you for sharing that. Um, um, so now I come to uh, Naomi. Um, so Naomi, uh, 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 the great work that you're doing in Kenya, and uh, of course, uh, suicide criminalization is a is, is, a, is a is a big issue in Kenya as well. So what needs to happen for suicide to be decriminalized in Kenya? Thank you. Um, I just want to start by apologizing. You can see in my background there are people moving. It's because of where I'm sitting right now. But uh, what matters is Completely the content. Fine. Completely fine. Yeah, what I'll say. So in my country, and just like the speakers before me have mentioned, it's a process. And our process uh, for decriminalizing suicide is aided by the uh, amendments that have been done in our Mental Health Act. We had a very old one, 1989, that was just recently amended and uh, sent it to by the president. So um, as a ministry, we have uh, the support of our parliamentarians when it comes to decriminalization of uh, suicide. And uh, the thing that we just went into an election just recently, and uh, the previous parliament, of course, we've seen the people who've come in. So it's a journey that we're going to continue with them. But even as we do that, we have a big win for us. We have recently launched our national suicide prevention strategy, which I believe is the first, is the first in the region. And it's a big thing. And what this strategy seeks to um, aim, actually the main vision is where we have a country where, or a Kenya where we have fewer lives that are being lost through suicide. And for that, uh, the main goal is to achieve a reduction by 10% in suicide mortality by the year 2030. So this strategy, it has some objectives that we intend to pursue. And we are not just doing that alone. We have stakeholders who have come on board who are also working within this space, the mental health space, and are also keen to see um, suicide cases, for example, being reported. Why I say being reported is that um, there's insufficiency of data being that it's a taboo subject and it's decriminalized. So most people who have gone that way, um, the report that will come on ground will not say that the person ended their lives by suicide, but rather um, some other reason. So to do that, we, we need to operationalize what we have just come up with, the national strategy uh, at the national level and at the county levels. And that means that we have uh, leadership and, and uh, a governance framework that is going to ensure that this happens by, for example, collaborating with uh, the partners that are there on the ground. Then aside from that, we have, um, we like I mentioned, we are advocating for decriminalization of suicide and uh, this, is by repealing section 226 of our penal code. And uh, with this, we are also working to collaborate with, for example, the Ministry of uh, Agriculture on pesticide control policy, and then also mobilize for financing to create this awareness at both national and county levels. Then also we are aiming to improve access um, to um, comprehensive quality services for suicide interventions at all levels of, of care, which means that we are trying to get to people before they end, um, before they get to that stage where they see suicide as a means to probably a problem they are experiencing. And for that, uh, some of the things that we intend to do is to have a national suicide prevention helpline that people are going to call in whenever they find themselves um, in danger of uh, attempting to end their lives. And last but not least is just to basically increase awareness on suicide, on suicide prevention and address stigma. I think you'll agree with me that when it comes to uh, matters mental health, there's a lot of discrimination, there's a lot of stigmatization around it. And that's why some people will lose their lives through suicide as opposed to them getting this help that they need for whatever psychological issues that they are doing, they could be going through. So one of the ways that we intend to increase awareness is uh, through the media. Um, in uh, what we've realized as a country is, uh, for example, our media 
they will explicitly, for example, say, uh, given a case, what happened, going to the nitty gritties, which, you know, can lead to even copy cutting. And in the process, they may not be able to share information on how someone can get help. So at the moment, we are working on a curriculum for them. And it's not just for the media, but various sectors within the, uh, the country, including education, um, uh, within workplaces, just to ensure that any person who could be going through any mental problem is, is reached at least in good time before there is any... Uh, before they get to that extreme end whereby they might contemplate on ending their lives. So with this and having this uh, uh, strategy developed, it's a guide, it's a framework that's going to, and it's not just limited to the national uh, ministry only, but any other person who wants to come on board, they can be able to use this as a guide to help us as a country so that by the time we get to 2030 and we look back, then we are seeing that, yes, we managed to reduce these numbers by what we had uh, hoped we would. So back to you, Chair. Thank you so much, Naomi. I think, uh, uh, and, and, and we're also getting some great questions um, uh, based on um, uh, uh, what you said. So looking forward to answering, uh, getting those answers as well. And I think that the steps that you've mentioned regarding um, a holistic approach, it's not just a legislative approach, you also have to bring population attitudes to uh, uh, to bring about the change. So I think that's a great point. So thank you so much, Naomi, for sharing your thoughts with us. Um, so um, uh, unfortunately, one of our panelists has having technical issues, uh, Duncan, so th um, they haven't been able to uh, fix them. So I think we'll be proceeding. Um, uh, uh, with the last question, and then we'll go towards the questions from the audience. Uh, so I think, uh, John, you'll be a great person to answer this. So, um, John, why is suicide an important issue for you? And what role uh, should people with lived experience play in issues uh, such as uh, suicide prevention and decriminalization? Well, for me, it's very personal. I have... Um... I have suicidal ideation um, and depression for which I'm medicated and for which I uh, seek psychiatric treatment on a fortnightly or monthly basis, depending on my mood, but on a re very regular basis. Now, I'm 53 now. I had a major suicide attempt when I was a member of parliament in New South Wales, whose capital is, is Sydney, so the biggest city in Australia, biggest province in Australia that led to the end of my political career. Um, to that point, I didn't know I had su suicidal ideation. I knew there was something wrong and I'd, I'd sought treatment um, in the past, but it really had never landed any condition, if I can use that phrase. Um, and uh, when I turned 50 just a couple of years ago, convincing myself, of course, that it wouldn't be a big change in my life. Of course, it was a big change in particular reflecting on my mental illness. And for me, um, I had a very difficult childhood with abuse and um, with, uh, with alcoholism and domestic violence. And from that perspective, that, that, is, that was the driver for me, without a doubt. And um, um, so for me, it became very much something I live with and something I, I have to live with. And I try not to live through it, if I can use that phrase. I don't want it to dominate my life but I need to be aware of it. And one of my great objectives is that we think about and we talk about and in our hearts, we feel about mental illness in the same way we talk about and we think about and we feel about physical illness. So for me, I, I sometimes liken it to say diabetes or heart condition. You know, I need to, um, I need to do a lot of things physically right in terms of eating well. I don't drink alcohol anymore. Um, I try and get more sleep because I know that's good for me. I try and avoid very stressful situations that I know will get me depressed and will get me distressed. So the older I've got, I'm, I'm far from perfect, but probably I've made enough mistakes to learn along the way um, how to live better with my suicidality. In Australia, um, it hasn't been a crime for a long time in most jurisdictions. Uh, and we thankfully uh, have become more and more open and more and more um, less 
judgmental about suicide. Um, we had uh, we have a couple of very major sporting codes in Australia. Um, a well-known figure from one of those sporting codes took his own life uh, three weeks ago, just before his 50th birthday. Um, now, rather than that being shunned, it was in fact openly talked about and received in a very um, sympathetic way rather than a judgmental way. Even though this man had young children, sort of eight and 10 years old, um, you know, the, the, the news media in Australia particularly in the areas where the sport this man played is very big. The news media were incredibly sympathetic about it. There was no criticism of him. Um, it, and it all turned very quickly to a debate about how do we make sure this doesn't happen to someone else. Someone else who outwardly looks very successful, has achieved an enormous amount, has played and coached at the highest level of his sport um, in his country, yet he took his own life. So. It, we, we do have constructive debates um, and we are, we, we are in an interesting phase in Australia that, um, which, is, which is an interesting result of the hard work that's happening, it will be an interesting, sorry, progression of the hard work that a lot of people who've spoken before me tonight uh, are doing. And that is the more you openly talk about suicide and mental illness, the more people present with mental illness and you need to have the facilities and the services to support them at that point in time because you're encouraging people you're saying to people come out talk to us about your mental illness tell us that you're feeling suicidal we want to help you through this situation so you do need the services there so we are whilst we are advanced in Australia um, we still have too many people dying by suicide and we still don't have enough support for people who need it when they need it but we get better all the time as I'm sure uh, say Priti was talking about feeling that improvement in India. Um, you, it's all we're all on this journey. I don't think anyone in the world has, has, has concluded this journey. We're all on this journey. We're at different points of it, and we can all learn from each other. But the good news, um, and part of why I contributed so strongly, is we hear a lot of people talk about living with, say, depression or bipolar. Um, we don't hear the suicide survivor journey as much often because it's so heart-wrenching. It's such a sad story to hear. It's a sad story to report and to publicise. But it's important for people to know that you can get right, right to that point of even starting the process of taking your own life and still come through the other end and have a fulfilling life. So living experience, lived experience is so critical in this because it's um, and I, I, I say this with no criticism of, it, of any academics and any academics on the panel or listening tonight, but an academic can, can speak academically. A lived experience or a living experience can speak very personally. They're not the enemy of each other. They're the friends of each other, very much the friends of each other, but they're almost talking to different audiences. And it's important that, that there be strong voices who live with suicidality, who've, who've, who've lived through suicide attempts um, and who may well face them again in the future, who can share their experience. We never want to normalise. We want to normalise mental health. We want to make it normal that people will have a mental illness and the way it's normal that they'll have a physical illness. We, I don't think we want to normalise suicide and to say, oh, that's all right, that, that we tick that box, that's fine. We, we, none of us would be on this, on this session today if we didn't believe suicide was by and large preventable with the right programs, right? And the right support and the right messages. So um, it's important not to normalise suicide, but to show people there's a way through because it's such a heavy and difficult issue to talk about in many places. It's and Australia is one of them as well. In some places, it's very heavily blanketed by values, judgments, by, by um, legal issues, by religious issues, by cultural issues, um, by tribal issues. So um, I think Nee made the point that, that it's the decriminalisation debate and getting decriminalisation um, in many, many countries is very different country to country because of cultural and other issues and very nuanced. Um, it's not, you don't stand in the middle of the town square with a loud, loud loudspeaker yelling out the message sometimes. You might at one point along the journey, but this is about yeah. very sophisticated campaigning. Thank you so much, uh, uh, John. That was, uh, 
And thank you for sharing your story as uh, someone with lived experience um, of surviving suicide myself. It's always um, very encouraging to sort of hear from others. So thank you. And uh, and so important that um, uh, the voice of academia is essential, but um, it speaks to a different audience and for advocacy, perhaps the lived experience voice can be more effective, more relatable, more human. Um, so, so thank you, John. Um, so I think we have so many questions from the audience. I have no idea how we're going to address all of them, but uh, some are similar questions. So I'll try to lump them uh, up and sort of present them to our various speakers. So, and, and thank you everyone for asking these amazing questions. Uh, so the first question is for Preeti. Um, so Preeti, uh, these are actually two questions and very important questions. These are very common sort of concerns. So will the decriminalization of suicide not open up the possibility of more instances of potential suicides, number one. And number two, um, won't this then lead to a potential abuse of decriminalization, of de decriminalizing suicide um, uh, in terms of that people feigning uh, mental illness to sort of avoid a prosecution or something? So, uh, so what do you have to say to that? Right. Um... So one is, it's a myth that if you talk more about suicide, it will lead to more suicides, right? And, and it's, it's a well-documented research thing. So in that sense, decriminalizing suicide... Do we have data? Do, 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 do we yeah, have evidence yeah. WHO, to support that? Yeah, WHO report says about it. Uh, our, uh, we published a report last year called uh, Suicide... Uh, and changing the need to change the narrative. So there is decriminalization of suicide. What does it mean? It means that what I have attempted is not a criminal offense. Abatement of suicide, somebody forcing me to take that action is still criminalized in all countries and laws. It just says that it is my personal decision and I should not be penalized for it. Um, and what kind of abuse of law would it actually lead to, right? So it is, even in India, if you are, if you are saying that I'm protesting for a particular change in society or law, and as part of that protest, I say I will do, say, fast and a hunger fast that may impact my health, that is still seen as an protest and activity and, and is in that sense criminalized. But for me to end my life because I cannot deal with the challenges that I am experiencing is my own personal experiences, right? And uh, there cannot be abuse of that law in any form. So decriminalization of suicide has shown that it results in more reporting because people seek out more help, but it does not necessarily lead to more deaths by suicide. Thank you so much, Preeti. And um, uh, I think this is a common misconception. So it's very important that this be addressed. So thank you for addressing it. Great. So my, my next question is from, uh, is for, um, I think, Ni would be a good person to answer this. Um, so, Neem, uh, 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 when we uh, talk about um, uh, the, uh, the framework, uh, so the framework within which suicide is presently discussed, so is it useful to move away from framing suicide only as a health or mental health issue and pushing to validate and address the life experiences and circumstances that play a role in suicide and self-harm? So, should we be talking about it as a medical issue or should we uh, instead moving uh, it to a more or like a social narrative uh, for effective advocacy? So in your opinion, yeah. uh, how should the issue be framed for us to develop an effective advocacy campaign for suicide prevention and decriminalization? Yeah, thank you yeah. very much. I imagine that um, the questioner uh, may be having in mind um, what happens in the low and middle income context. And I think this is our situation because only yesterday on, on, on um, IAPS um, podcast, we were discussing that 
yes, when you look at the statistics, uh, you are, we are always told that mental health uh, disorders or untreated mental health conditions will account for over 90% of um, suicide in high income contexts. But when you come to low and middle income countries, generally, of course, there are some mental disorders, but they appear not to be that pronounced. It has to do more with existential issues, um, the life situation of people. And I think that um, the questioner actually answered the question by the second part of the question. It is important that we start, uh, or we are careful not to um, limit the conversation around suicide within the context of only um, mental health and mental health disorders. Um, we need to um, also move away from that. Otherwise, we may end up pathologizing um, um, suicide. And suicide, as we all know, is not a disease. It is a behavior that has history and logic behind it for the person involved. And so it is important that we begin to explore all of those lived histories, all of those life uh, circumstances, see what things can be changed, see how things can be improved, see what role the person involved can also play to improve the situation so that whatever acute situation is it that drives the suicidal tendencies can be dealt with. So yeah, I, I agree with the points that we, we need to begin looking as well uh, or begin directing the conversation around the social circumstances and the lived experiences, uh, not just the mental health disorders. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nia. And, and yes, I think um, uh, 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 when it comes to creating a public narrative, then terminology which is palatable for lay people must be used. And that terminology often needs to uh, derive from social contexts rather than biomedical ones. So thank you, Ni. I think that's a great point. Um, so uh, Naomi, uh, this next one's for you. I think you'd be the perfect person to answer this. Uh, so in the absence of studies um, which elaborate the impact of decriminalization of, of suicide on prevention of suicide, because there's a lack of evidence apparently. Um, so how can we, in the absence of this data, um, then how can we convince parliamentarians to decriminalize suicide? How can we build the narrative when we don't, allegedly, we don't have uh, concrete data that decriminalizing suicide will be will reduce rates of uh, suicide. Uh, so, Naomi, would you like to uh, answer this one? Yeah, um, in the Kenyan context, I wouldn't say that we don't have any data at all. It's only that what is there does not reflect the accurate position on the ground. Um, because um, we have our National Bureau of Statistics and every year they give us numbers on various areas and um, suicide is one of them. We had like, um, I think it was in 2019 where by the time you were reaching, uh, I think August, I'm not so sure about that, but they'd already reported that there were about 421 deaths. So it's not that there isn't any data at all. It's just that we know that whatever is there does not reflect what's actually on the ground. And again, this is because it's a taboo subject. Um, and this is related also with the stigma and the, dis the discrimination that not just the people who've actually attempted their lives experience, but also their loved ones, their, their, their next of kin, who are also left with um, uh, that tag behind them, that people look at them and say, you're coming from that home where someone actually attempted to end their lives. So, you know, there's that stereotype that comes out of it. So because of that, many people would avoid uh, giving, like people would attend the funerals, but they will not say exactly what ended this person's life. So it's not just, it's not that we don't have any um, evidence at all. Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, um, so I think this is a very interesting question and I think John, uh, you'll be the perfect person to answer this because of the, your experience in so many different countries with the organization. So in countries where there are um, special uh, sensitive issues, for example, uh, religio-cultural beliefs, um, uh, which sort of, uh, let's say, criminalized suicide spiritually, right, which is a spiritual criminalization of suicide. So how do we do advocacy in these countries? Um, 
uh, uh, keeping in mind uh, as uh, not to turn people away or to also sort of uh, not a sort of uh, create a religious opposite religious cultural opposition against suicide decriminalization um so yeah uh gee that's a a tough question to answer from so many directions um so let me have a go uh what i what i think with many social changes or religious changes or societal changes uh, that may require um, legal changes to support them is often you need a breakthrough moment. So let me use New Zealand as an example. I don't know, my father is a New Zealander. I don't know if there are any New Zealanders on the line. But um, New Zealand was a reasonably middle of the road country on, on most issues um, and, and beginning to be less stigmatised on issues like suicide and mental illness. But probably the one, one of the most, and I'm back to talking about sport again, one of the most famous sporting figures in their country, uh, uh, New Zealand's a small country of 5 million people where rugby union yeah, a, a sport, uh, 15 people aside playing a, with a, a ball like that, a, a rugby sort of ball, um, is, is the largest, is the most influential organisation. Everybody plays, almost everybody plays the sport. It's a very large sport. The former captain of the team, a man called John Kerwin, Sir John Kerwin, came out and talked about his own depression and just changed the debate overnight. So, as with so many things in life, it's about leadership. Having a so, somebody who's um, uh, not anti-religion or not anti the values of the day is probably seen as a basic mainstream character, but break the taboo by talking about it themselves and also break the bubble, the pretense that it doesn't happen. You know, I mean, we know in some countries where suicide is a crime, people sort of, you know, ignore it as I said before they they pretend it didn't happen or they change the circumstances of the death so the family doesn't have the shame um and or whatever it might be or, or of course as pretty said you've still got situations despite what the law says um yeah. the authorities can be very slow to follow the law yeah. but the, but once again back to the point we made before there's a journey happening and if you get a breakthrough moment where a very high profile person can break out of uh, the norm and talk about it you'll have an instant backlash from many people but at the same time mm. people will say well if that person if that very famous person whether they're a singer or or an actor um, or whether they're a sportsman or woman whatever it might be a politician a former politician if they can talk about it then I can talk about it so um, this is the importance mm. back to your earlier point about li living lived experience that yeah. you begin to destigmatize it by literally somebody who has it talking about it publicly. Mm. Now, um, in some countries, the media mightn't report it. I mean, it might be a very hard journey to get it up and running. In other countries, yeah. the doors will slowly open. So um, I've heard a few of our speakers tonight talk and, and reading some of the comments about the slowness of the journey. Uh, we should never give up because we, we all know we're doing the right thing. Um, yeah. And I thought the point that Naomi made was excellent, which is mm. one of the challenges we have in advocating for suicide prevention is the, the statistics are rubbish because they don't mm. actually tell us the real situation. Yeah. So um, there are probably, you know, which is <laughs> if we actually reported in some countries, in some areas, the, the number of genuine suicides and suicide attempts um, the numbers would go right up, but decriminalising it will just help to give us better statistics and better numbers and the like. So it, it, it is a challenging debate because some yeah. people yeah. Will, will run the argument of, well, if it's not a crime, more people will kill themselves. Of course, you know, they, they will, that, that's, that will, yeah. they will run so their thanks, own logic. Thank you so much, John. Thank, thank you so much. <laughs> So I'm just sorry we just uh, we, we so much, but 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 those are very interesting uh, uh, observations, and I, I think 
the voice of lived experience is critical for the destigmatization and then to change societal attitudes. So thank you, John. So and so and so um, thank you to all of our speakers, all of our guests. I'm so sorry uh, they've been such amazing questions and please feel free to join the circle and also to email uh, all the panelists the information will be shared if you want to ask any questions directly so the panelists one last statement so take 10 seconds and sort of just uh, 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 it'll be great if you can just quickly sort of mention uh, that we can hope we can create hope through action on suicide so something tweetable we can create hope through action on suicide by so, uh, Preeti, would you like to go first? We can create hope through action on suicide by? Uh, by designing, supporting, and financing programs that have a psychosocial, public health, and community-based approach and centers the experiences of people, uh, centers the lived experiences. Eloquent as always, Preeti. Thank you. Uh, Ni, would you like to go next? Uh, Ni? Sorry. Um, I know this. Uh, I'm, I'm muted. Would you, would you like to just yes. share a quick uh, tweetable sentence on uh, we can create hope through action on suicide by? It's a quick 10 second sort of line. We can create That's hope just, through action on suicide by? Through empathic listening. I, I started off by wanting to change the world with my suicide research, but I noticed that I couldn't change the world. But I just doing the listening, empathic listening, genuine listening, I could change the entire world Beautiful. of the pressing experience in suicide crisis. So Thank you so much. Listening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Like empathetic listening, beautifully said. Um, Naomi, would you like to go next? Yeah, um, we can create um, hope through action by normalizing the conversation around suicide and by also destigmatizing the, uh, the, the, the people who attempt to end their lives as well as their families, helping them rather than Thank neglecting you. them. Thank you Thank so you. much. Man. Thank you so much. And last but not the least, uh, John. By oh, using by using high profile people in our communities to break the stigma. Brave, very brave people to help to break the stigma. Beautifully said. So thank you once again, all of our pa wonderful panelists and the lovely audience. On 6 September, uh, the World Health Organization will be holding an interactive session on their new quality rights e-training. Uh, the link to register is in the chat. Um, at this session, you will learn about how this new resource can help improve the way in which services and support are provided to people with, uh, with mental health conditions. All the attendees are invited to participate in an interactive discussion with the World Health Organization to help shape the rollout strategy of this new initiative. More information can be found on the circle. Uh, thank you, everyone. It was a lovely conversation. Thank you, all the panelists. And looking forward to uh, seeing you off uh, the camera. <laughs> Take care and Allah Hafiz and uh, Asalaamu Alaikum. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. And bye.